Good morning and welcome to our event on the opportunities for Irish business on the continent, co-hosted by ourselves, the Institute of International European Affairs and Enterprise Ireland, the state agency tasked with assisting companies boost to their exports. My name is Dan O'Brien and I'll be in the chair over the next 90 minutes for this, the second in a series of three Europe is our future seminars. EU markets, and in particular the Eurozone, represent significant diversification opportunities for Irish companies. The ability to seek out new additional opportunities and capitalize them, capitalize on them will be a major uh, success factor for Irish companies in the, in the years ahead. This webinar, uh, which, as I say, is the second in a series of webinars with Enterprise Ireland, will explore uh, sales and marketing strategies to engage a wider European uh, audience and market for Irish companies. The running order for this morning's event, we'll see the Minister for Europe, um, Thomas Byrne TD, opening the event and setting the scene. He'll be followed by one of Ireland's leading economists and chairperson of the National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, Professor Francis Rouen. The main section of the morning will bring together four people who are at the coalface of cross-border commerce in Europe, and I'll introduce them all in more detail at the start of the panel session. Before getting underway, some brief housekeeping notes. Uh, this event is entirely on the record, which applies to both the speakers and those who put questions and comments. Um, the audience is invited to put those comments and uh, questions via the Zoom function, uh, Q&A Zoom function at the bottom of your screens. So please chip in, uh, in, uh, in using that, uh, that method. Uh, make your comments, add, ask questions. They can be general, they can be specific for individual uh, individual speakers, panelists, etc. And my colleagues ask me to let those of you know who are on social media that you can tweet using the handle at IIEA if you are so minded. So uh, to get our event underway, I'd like to invite the Europe Minister, Thomas Byrne, uh, TD, uh, just briefly, a uh, little uh, bio of the minister. He was first elected, elected to Dolaren to represent Mead, Mead East in 2007. Uh, from that time until 2011, he was a member of the Oireachtas Committee on Justice, Equality and Defence, Social Protection and on Finance and Public Service. In 2011, um, he was elected to the Shannon for the Cultural and Educational Panel. He served as a senator. Uh, over that um, period to 2016, during which time he was a Fingerpool spokesperson on public expenditure and reform. In 2016, he was elected uh, again to Dáil Éireann from that, during over that term from 2016 to 2020, he served as the Fianna Fáil party spokesperson on education. Uh, following the 2020 election, he was appointed Minister of State for European Affairs by on Taoiseach, Taoiseach Michal Martin. Minister, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to your opening remarks. Morning, Dan. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me here this morning. And thanks to all the panel as well for giving up their time and, and, and people who are here as well for what's a really important uh, event, I think, and, and discussion as well. Um, it's a good opportunity, I think, for me as well to outline the importance of the European Union in our own government economic strategy. Because, of course, we know the European Union, and we take for granted sometimes, has been a significant positive influence on our development and will play a pivotal role in the future. Can I first mention um, the government's global Ireland strategy, which is, I suppose, the, the government strategy uh, on doubling Ireland's international footprint by 2025. So the strategy encompasses diplomacy, culture, education, education tourism, uh, and, of course, business and trade. Central to the strategy is membership of the European Union, and the relationship with the European Union and uh, with member states. And it involves uh, us working with individual member states at every level in those, in those fields. Um, we have strategies now with, with, our, with France uh, and with Germany, um, and indeed with the Nordic region as well. And that's about deepening engagement. And as I said, not just in, in terms of diplomacy, but also in terms of uh, trade uh, and business, culture, education, etc. So, we want to uh, proactively work to build trade with European Union member states um, and to double Irish business exports to the Eurozone by 2025. And of course, the IIEA play a key role in, in providing a forum like this to engage in discussion and debate and, and raising the profile of all things uh, European. Business and trade with the EU holds a central position in the global 
Ireland's strategy. And of course, this is more important in light of Brexit and then, of course, in light of COVID. Strong trade with EU member states is crucial to successful economic growth. Uh, there are clear benefits of access to a single market and with no customs, no tariffs, and a population of 440 million. That's something we're going to have to talk about a lot more, particularly as we become a net contributor to the European Union budget. Um, there are additional costs and uh, procedural benefits using a single currency when trading. Um, but there are no additional costs uh, um, and there are procedural benefits using a currency when trading uh, with countries in the Eurozone. Regulatory alignment, of course, is a growing advantage. The absence of mobile roaming charges, and see them creeping back in, in the UK. And that's just one example of costs being reduced by a single EU approach. And this is replicated in a growing number of sectors. And the reputation of Irish products and services is strong in Europe. Where Irish businesses are recognised for their innovation, flexibility and friendly business style. And this week I was pleased to visit the Ornua uh, cheese factory in Spain. A really good example of an, an Irish company innovating in Europe and exporting an Irish product as well to be uh, processed and sold on uh, then uh, in the in European Union and indeed in that case worldwide. I know that Enterprise Ireland's Eurozone strategy is designed to help Irish enterprise take advantage of the opportunity that the Eurozone presents and position the Eurozone as an extension of the domestic market. And that's the way we have to look at it. And uh, so Enterprise Ireland now has eight offices in six Eurozone countries, Netherlands, Germany, France, Belgium, Italy, Spain, uh, two new offices in Munich and Lyon uh, opened in 2019. And there's about 40 market advisors providing support to Enterprise Ireland clients building their Eurozone business. Despite COVID, um, ex exports grew in 2020 to the Eurozone by 1.6%. So things are still happening. There was even much greater growth uh, in 2019 at 15%. So the range of opportunities for Irish business in the Eurozone is cross sectoral. Engineering, of course, life sciences, high tech construction, digital technology, um, and of course, traditional sectors um, and innovation in traditional sectors such as agriculture, finance, construction, uh, and logistics. The EU's focus on an increased investment in decarbonizing the economy that we've seen in the 5055 strategy launched this week um, is also creating new opportunities for Irish companies. So, my message to business today is to work with Enterprise Ireland to take advantage of the supports and to take full advantage of our European Union membership that unfortunately our British friends took for granted. Uh, and I, I, I feel, I uh, didn't really feel uh, and understand the full benefits of. So Enterprise Ireland, of course, is uniquely positioned to help uh, Irish business. And there's a number of points I would make though. Uh, language. First, our advantage. Um, Ireland is now the only native English speaking country in the European Union. This is a huge advantage for business actually. And we, we don't really consider that. Uh, but we shouldn't be complacent. Um, and it's, but it's more important than ever then to expand and improve on our language skills. European language capability will enhance our ability to build relationships with European partners. Crucially for trade, it will enhance our ability to take advantage of the business opportunities in the EU. So I would encourage Irish businesses not only to take advantage of the English language that we all speak so well, uh, but to prioritise language, other language skills as an essential skill. Um, I know that enterprise Ireland encourages business to speak in the language of their customers uh, and language is a key sales and marketing skill. Uh, without it, you're starting your sales and marketing activity one step behind your competitors. Um, but the right, the right language skills can be recruited because obviously language acquisition takes a bit of time. And Enterprise Ireland does provide support to make help, including key manager grants uh, and the Grad Start programs, um, which uh, assist uh, financial assistance uh, where individual, individuals with language skills are required. And of course, we can recruit people with language skills right from right across the European Union. Again, thanks to our membership of the European Union. Now, Ireland as well has another advantage. Uh, we have a strong diaspora across the EU, uh, which is very well integrated into society, including with language skills. Uh, and indeed, many Europeans have a strong connection with Ireland, and often there's a positive experience of studying in English in, our, in Ireland, you see. So that this week in Spain as well. This is a significant resource uh, and there are people who are enthusiastic about providing formal and informal support to Irish business and of course a pool for potential, recruit, potential recruits to Irish business as well. Uh, if I may, I may just mention the government's strategy to increase uh, Irish representation uh, in the European institutions uh, in terms of employment and this again is to maintain our influence 
in the European Union, but of course throughout, throughout the member states of the European Union as well. So in May, I launched uh, a strategy called A Career for You uh, to significantly increase uh, the numbers of Irish officials in permanent and temporary positions in the EU institutions, uh, to increase Irish people, the numbers of Irish people applying for jobs and improving the awareness uh, of, of careers as well. That's very important. And indeed, for, for people who have uh, those skills and dealing with business across uh, the European Union, uh, this might be another step up the career ladder as well, uh, if that's what they want to do in terms of public service in particular. Now, our diplomatic network, Ireland is well, not unique, but not everybody has. We, we have an embassy in every EU member state. Um, our embassies work collaboratively with Enterprise Ireland and other state agencies to accelerate the growth of Irish companies in those markets. So our embassies in every member state of the European Union are a big tool for Ireland's business sector to make inroads in new European markets. And I have to say our ambassadors and officials do really go beyond the call of duty in supporting business. So it's a resource that should always be called upon. Of course, we have a permanent representation in Brussels for the European Union, and that plays a key role in ensuring that the voice of Irish business is heard at the EU table, particularly in relation to policy regulation and the level playing field. Um, its main task, of course, is to ensure that the country's interests and policies are pursued as effectively as possible at the European Union. So just to, to thank uh, the IIEA on the 30th anniversary and to commend their work and uh, providing this forum for exchange uh, of ideas and information on, on, on European affairs, and if you aren't members, I would strongly encourage you to do so and uh, to stay abreast of political and policy de uh, developments across the European Union. So thanks to um, Michael Collins and Dan O'Brien and Anne Lanigan from uh, Enterprise Ireland for organising the event. And I know uh, that the speakers uh, who are coming to this event have, have a huge amount of practical experience and have somebody, some of them perhaps, uh, would have received uh, support or, or, or have had engagements uh, with their official uh, services. Um, just to thank the business community for joining the discussion this morning for your hard work and your commitment, which is the foundation of our economy. Um, governments uh, don't direct, uh, don't create jobs by, by direction or by uh, making new laws. It's, uh, we're there to provide the, the architecture that you can uh, succeed in and thereby the country succeeds economically as well. But we do firmly believe that a deeper business and trade relationship with the European Union is crucial for a future prosperity. And I will say this, and that the, the benefits of the European Union are felt right across society, particularly in business. And it's really, really important that business maintains, um, that business is active uh, in promoting uh, a positive vision and a positive experience of the European Union. Uh, because we saw what happened in, 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 in Britain with Brexit, uh, and that can very easily be, um, you know, there's no, nothing to say that couldn't happen again in some other member states if people start taking the advantages for granted, if they forget and uh, the benefits of it, uh, and if they simply um, uh, allow uh, debate to be taken over uh, by negative voices. So I think it's really important that we, 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 we speak, speak up for ourselves at the European Union table, but understand as well uh, that our status as a small country and the status of our businesses coming from a small country uh, are significantly enhanced by being at that table uh, in Brussels and I think it's very very important for the business community to keep uh, amplifying that message. So look thanks very much this morning and I, I look forward to your discussion uh, in the uh, time ahead. Thank you. Many thanks Minister for joining us for setting the scene and uh, for your kind words about our, our efforts here at the Institute. Uh, much appreciated and, and very much tee up uh, the morning, um, perhaps moving from more the political over to the policy side of things. It's a pleasure to welcome to the event um, Frances Rouen. Uh, Frances is one of Ireland's leading um, economists. She is an honorary fellow at Trinity College Dublin and a research affiliate, affiliate at the Economic and Social Economic and Social Research Institute here in Dublin. Um, she has held academic and senior administrative posts in Trinity over the decades, and she was also the director of the ESRI uh, for a decade, so 2006, 2015. Her research interests are in economic development, international economics, and public policy, and she's published widely in these areas, which uh, you will agree makes her an ideal person to give a sort of overview uh, on the matters under discussion today. So thanks, Francis, for joining us. And the floor is yours. 
Good morning, Anne, and thank you very much, everybody, for coming on this event today. I want to congratulate Enterprise Ireland and the IEA for, <clears throat> for providing this forum. I think there's a real need to discuss how we can increase our sales by Irish exporters into Europe uh, and how to support this. This is not a, a, a new topic. Um, it's been something which we've talked about since, if not God was a child, since I was a very young person, because my first job was in the IDA uh, way back in the 1970s. And at that stage, the focus on Europe was growing as we were entering into the EU. I think it's terrific to have a global Ireland strategy now and that Europe is such a key part of that. Um, I would really uh, support what the minister had said about the whole of government approach. I think in the past, the agencies were more separate when they were in different countries. And indeed, they were quite separate from the diplomats. And I think that integration in the last less than 10 years, I'd say, I think has been something which is very much to be to be uh, to be applauded. So I'm going to touch on four topics today. So if you can turn to the next slide, please. Uh, the first is the importance of competitiveness and productivity uh, in the context of exporting. The second is just to talk a little bit about strategic trade theory. And don't think I'm going to give you a lecture on this, but I just want to give you the two focal points as to why the way economists think about this matters for what you read about and, and, and understand. Uh, and that link with globalization and regionalization. What Irish uh, research can tell us about the challenges that have been, um, uh, been faced by, by Irish owned companies in exporting to EU countries and the role that policy can play in relation to in relation to to, uh, to Irish exports, and that obviously become to the EU, and that becomes particularly important in the context of Brexit. So, if you could turn to the next slide, please. So, just the way of thinking about competitiveness and productivity, and I'm coming from the perspective of the, of the National Competitiveness and Productivity Council here. So, we think of it really at the country level and at the company level. So, at the country level, for any business in Ireland doing uh, uh, producing products and services to sell abroad or to compete with foreigners on the domestic market, the cost of doing business is really important. So that's a key feature of looking at the country level at uh, the backdrop to successful exporting and to successful trading. Uh, the second thing at the national level are the national productivity drivers. Uh, and that's really around what's the basis on which we're a productive economy. Uh, so we're talking here about uh, the levels of education, the quality of the infrastructure, the investment in research and development, the investment in other supports that actually make the economy work effectively and that improve the productivity of people who are operating businesses in the economy. These are ones which government primarily controls. And then secondly, uh, thirdly, at the country level, there's the single market and the euro area, because those arrangements that our government has entered into with the rest of Europe presents a, a framework in which it's easier for people to trade into the single market, as the minister said, reduce barriers. And that's been, I think, one of the biggest successes of my lifetime and the changes that I've seen. And then the euro area means that you've no exchange rate costs at all in doing business across the euro area countries. Um, at the company level, then there's the issue of product diversity. Um, there's, the, there's the fact that companies don't grow by selling exactly the same product in the same way forever. And by and large, they need to diversify. Uh, and they diversify by changing that product or they diversify into new markets. And that's why the Ornua reference that the minister made was quite, quite interesting because that's a product that's a gold plated product, if you like, which we're now selling into new markets. And, and uh, obviously Spain trying to hopefully catch up on where Germany has got to in its appreciation of Irish butter. And then finally, there's, there's company level productivity. And that's a lot to do with how companies in Ireland are managing their whole operations of which exporting is a part. Uh, and I'll come back to that in, 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 in a moment. So if you could turn to the next slide, please. So I want here to, to uh, make reference to what, what we call in, in, in economic strategic trade theory, and it's linked with globalization and regionalization. And just to say that globalization is a term we're all used to. There are people who are critics of it and people are positive about it, but really it's about the huge integration of the world across the last four decades. And in particular, what's become very apparent, and I think the British possibly didn't appreciate fully, was that an awful lot of globalization is regionalization. You actually trade mostly with the countries that are relatively near to you. And there's a lot of uh, trade theories that actually explain why that, is, why that is the case. And those theories are actually quite relevant for, for policy and policy design. So the two sources of this um, area of strategic trade theory is global strategic rivalry. And this is related to Paul Krugman, who won the Nobel Prize for this, his work in this, in this area. And it's the idea that companies 
don't just accept themselves as being, they might be a small player in a, in a big market, but that they have, an, and they have ways of changing the competitive advantage by choosing how and how they market, by choosing who they cooperate with, by who's, who's who they compete strongly with, basically by, by the focus that they place on market positioning. And this was a very new way of thinking about trade for economists way back in the, 19, in the, in the 1980s. The second area that's important here and one that you, many of you will be probably familiar with is related to Michael Porter at Harvard uh, and who wrote around 1990 about national competitiveness advantage. And this was the idea that countries didn't just accept the fact that they had a certain by nature advantage uh, or economic, economic advantages, but that they in fact would have we would be in a position to change that competitive advantage uh, by their investments. And something like, for example, setting up Science Foundation Ireland was a decision by the Irish government to strengthen our ability as a country to have a, a strong resource in terms of, of research in Ireland in the universities and then in linking the universities over to the businesses. So that's a kind of that's how you change competitive advantage. So that's basically the country level and the company level. Now, to make this kind of real, uh, what's been absolutely vital has been increased data from the 1990s, which allows you to link, uh, to look behind the big numbers. So, you know, you'll find a minister talking about an increase of X or increase of N million or increase of X billion uh, in exports. Um, the reality is that's made up of a whole set of interactions and all of you who are online who do, who do are involved in business know exactly what that means. But what we now have since the 19, 1990s is the ability to link those kind of aggregate figures with what lies behind at the strategic behavior of companies involved in trading, marketing, R&D, innovating, management capability, et cetera. So that's really been a big breakthrough and a hugely important part of helping Ireland to have an evidence base for the policy changes that it's, it's been making. So I suppose the way of thinking about trade focuses now very much on dynamics. Uh, whereas back in the day, there was a tendency to think, you know, we got a large company who's exporting, it'll be fine, it'll get on with that. In fact, that isn't what happens. There's a constant dyna dynamism in all of these markets. Um, and, and uh, you know, obviously Brexit for us is a huge change in the dynamic uh, landscape in which we operate. So in relation to dynamics, a big issue is about diversity, individual products and services that are different. So you're not just producing one product, but you're producing many version, versions of that product or that services. And that service is actually then being honed a product to particular markets. But there's also another point, which I think from a policy perspective really matters. And that is that exporters are at different stages of the life cycle. And it's really important to know that at any stage. And I think the, the Enterprise Ireland colleagues will be very aware of this, that at early stages, there's a certain set of issues for you. At more mature and middle stages, there are other ones. And then at a later stage, there may be the transition of that business over to another family member or something that changes that dynamic, which is really important one to recognize because it turns out to be quite significant when you explore the data. The other thing is the issue of concentration and specialization. You want to be, you want to be, you want to specialize because very often you get more, you're more productive if you specialize, but you don't want to be overly concentrated either in particular products or services that are narrow or in particular export markets. So for example, if you're selling a lot, and as we've all discovered, you're selling a lot into the UK and circumstances change, then if you like, in terms of a portfolio risk, you're obviously more exposed to that change. From the point of view of economics, there are two uh, matters that people focus on a lot from kind of metrics perspective. Uh, and you'll hear it again a lot discussed by, by, by ministers and by agencies. And that's the number of players in the market. So the increase in the number of Irish exporters. And that's a hugely important thing to be focusing on. Are we increasing the number of exporters and are they diversifying into many other different, 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 different countries and different markets? But there's also then the average amount that they're selling. So it's there the two kind of metrics, and we use that both for markets, for the numbers of companies, like the size of companies in terms of value versus numbers, and for the products and services. And then the final issue to, to, to really notice is that in trade statistics at the national, at the aggregate level, you don't see an enormous amount of change year to year. You do see some changes, but you see a huge amount of change taking place below those aggregate statistics. And the strategic approach to, to, to looking at trade policy is to take account of that. So if you could turn to the next um, slide, please. 
So I just put down here our total Irish export markets. This is in goods markets in, in the EU in 2020. And the list of countries is down the left-hand side with Belgium at the top and then Germany, Netherlands, France, etc. cetera. Um, almost certainly we know, and this is something we need to research and learn more about, that the figures to Belgium and Netherlands reflect products that are probably part of um, global value chains. So those numbers are sort of disproportionate to the size of the country. You'd normally expect them to be closer aligned. So obviously Germany, but France uh, and France could be lower. These figures, again, I, in my view, need to need a lot more explanation to know precisely what's happening as between those close European countries through which trade takes place, particularly given where the ports are based. On the right hand side, just a picture to give you and and uh, of the of the IE exports. And you just see where the UK is over on the right hand side. So the red, red arrow down is showing you basically the market that's disappearing. So if you think about it, what we're trying to do is looking across that panoply to look at, at how we basically are going to increase our market exports. So I'd now like you to turn to the next slide, uh, which is just to deal with the question of what does Irish research tell us about the challenges um, for Irish owned expo exporters to the UK, to the EU, I should say, not the UK. Um, so we want to, this kind of research is intended to inform policymakers, to inform government, obviously, and to give a perspective to individual cases. So any of you who are on this line who have businesses, you have particular experiences related to yours. What government needs to know in the design of policies is how, how, how those perspectives differ, what the, the, the range is across them. And the data that, that have informed this hugely in Ireland in recent times is both data from the Central Statistics Office and from Enterprise Ireland itself. So my first bullet point here is to say, and it's, a, it's, a, it's one of my bugbears, is that there's no such thing as the EU market. So when people said, well, oh, shift from the UK to the EU market, there is no the EU market. Each market has different characteristics. And the minister mentioned, mentioned language uh, and mentioned our, our, our um, um, diaspora out in, in countries. But there's also our recent immigrants here who could be important assets uh, as well as those diaspora. So that's the first thing. So companies don't decide I'm going to export into Europe. You have to decide I'm going to export into some particular market in Europe. And given the size of a country, it might be some region within that, that market within Europe. Certainty supports entry into new markets and I think and the creation of new products. So I think one of the roles of government as far as it can, and it's been very challenging in the last decade between the financial crisis and now particularly with Brexit, but to create as much certainty as possible. When there's market volatility, governments should try to give certainty. And as we know, in many dimensions, that's extremely difficult. Um, Obviously, exchange rates uh, uh, if you, uh, are controlled by, are done by markets, but obviously, if you're selling into the euro area, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, product standards, which was the big success of the single European market, really, really vital because you know you don't have to keep modifying your product on a standards basis. You might for tastes, but not for standards. And then logistics, I think another one that's come to the fore in recent times. So if you're going to be exporting, can you get your goods to market in Europe? Are there the, the services, um, uh, the shipping services that are going to let you get there? Is there, you know, what role does government have to make sure that there's a better logistics environment available for people to be able to do that? Fourth, third bullet really is that, and this comes from longstanding research, that the companies that export successfully typically have had higher productivity than other companies prior to exporting. Now, there's some literature which suggests that when you export, you also learn and your productivity goes up. But by and large, the, um, you're a stronger, you're stronger before, you, before, you, before you start to export, which means that Enterprise Ireland needs to be finding those companies that can support, uh, can support exporting, because obviously if they're not strong before they export, that could put a weakness on a successful domestic industry or into a new market if that's what they're planning to do. So the fourth bullet here is that companies that have exported beyond the UK have been generally more productive than exporters to the UK only. So this is work that I would have done a number of years ago, which showed effectively a higher what's called export premium for companies that were exporting to the EU over to the UK from Ireland. And really, and these, these were Irish indigenous companies, and really what's going on there is that the, e, the UK was an easier market. So you didn't necessarily have to uh, be as, 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 as productive uh, going into that market as you had to be going into the into the into the, the EU market. So it's recognizing the challenge and I think it's, it's expect, accepting the support of Enterprise Ireland in terms of doing this. And very quickly, I just want to reference uh, on the next slide some very new research that's come out from the SRI in the last couple of years. Uh, and the first is and it's a, it's, it's a result that happens internationally. So 
everybody's focusing on the big companies, but most exporting companies are actually quite small. They sell just a few products and they sell them into a small number of destinations. That's true for every country in the world. Relative to size, obviously, it makes a difference, but, but that's the case. Export growth is largely driven by increasing numbers of products and markets rather than growth of sales in existing products and markets. And that's a result you mightn't quite expect. So in fact, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, you, it's really talking about that dynamic I mentioned earlier, that you want to have increasing numbers of products and markets and not just say, well, I have these three markets, I'm going to, and these two products, I'm going to try and just to deal with those. If you're going to be a long-term, have long-term growth, you need to be you need to be engaged in, in in looking all the time at new markets and at new and new products and services. Continuing exporters are dynamic. So those with the previous one, they're frequently introducing new products, they're dropping products, they're entering and exiting markets. So the data on an annual basis for any company is huge variability. When you add it up for the whole economy, you don't see quite as much. But it's really important for those guiding policy and supporting people exporting to realize just how much dynamic there is in the system. And then finally, taking a successful product to new markets is more likely to succeed than expanding the product range within an existing market. So what does that mean? Well, if you're exporting to Austria, it would suggest that actually trying to sell your product into Germany is probably more likely to succeed than trying to sell, extend your product range further into, into Austria. So it's that notion, particularly if you take a market that's near to you and that's like one you're already selling into, it suggests that that's what you should do. So final slide. So what to consider when designing exports for, for or buying supports for export growth. So I would say four, four bullet points here. Establish supports that scale in implementation. So in other words, they can't, if they're, if they're terribly expensive to put in place and to operate and to implement, and by expensive here, I mean expensive on the, on the, on the business as well as on the agencies that's supporting you. And um, we want to make them scale efficiently in terms of, 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 of implementation and that they can handle company diversity effectively. So it's not a one shoe fits all, as everybody in this call will know. And it's a question of how do you manage that balance between getting a scale of implementation and managing the diversity? You want to increase in cer certainty in the exporting environment. And I mentioned that with regard to logistics. And obviously, it's the case that if you're selling into the eurozone, the exchange of risk, which is often a big risk for companies, an expensive risk to take account of, doesn't have to be dealt with. Support companies that have an export strategy fully integrated into their business strategy and strengths. And that's a really big difference. One of the success stories of Ireland over the last 30 years has been the integration of different functions into Enterprise Ireland so that your export strategy is part of your overall strategy. And that's what's shown in the data to make a huge difference to your success. Have the capacity to ad adapt cost effectively to different markets. So it's really important that companies are able to demonstrate that. Uh, because otherwise, you, you, you know, supporting them and in going into a market where they're not able to uh, cost effectively adjust could actually cause them long term, long term problems. Support companies that can identify key individual markets in the EU. As I said at the beginning, I, I, whenever I hear somebody saying export into the EU, you want to export into the markets that are in the EU. And finally, diversify into closely related markets. So I'm talking about the, the um, could be France, Belgium, it could be Belgium, Luxembourg, or you could be Austria, Germany. But they are, where they're closely related in terms of taste and obviously in terms of language, it, it adds to that. And then finally, and I would have to say this as chair of the National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, address the longstanding market and institutional failures within Ireland, because they all bear down on the costs of people who are trying to export successfully. So I'm talking about longstanding market difficulties like insurance, and I'm talking about institutional uh, failures and difficulties like planning. These are underpinning what every business is trying to do. And I think as a country, uh, given that business has a huge increased challenge of finding new markets, we want to deal with many of these aspects that are sitting there and they're there for a long time and they don't cost money to do. So I think addressing those would also be a huge benefit to people who are exporting. So let me stop there, Dan, thank you. Many thanks, Francis. Uh, fantastic overview uh, across a whole range of things on that point that there, there of course, it is a single market in Europe, but there's no EU market, so to speak, uh, national and regional markets. Um, a, a little follow up, uh, if I may, as you said, you started your career in the 70s with the IDA, so you've been observing this closely. Um, one of the main objectives of this morning's discussion is to familiarize people with uh, the opportunities there are in, in Europe. 
over time, do you get a sense that business in Ireland, people doing business in Ireland have just become more familiar with Europe? They may have studied there. They certainly travel there more often with the advent of cheap travel, that, that Europe just feels less far away. And that as a factor is making people less daunted about considering exporting uh, when they're in business. I think that is the case. Um, I also think that probably as a country, we took a little bit of a pedal off the, 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 um, the car in terms of Europe for a period. We were putting our resources into global diversification. And I said, do you remember I mentioned that globalization for the most part in many instances is strongly based on regionalization that you're selling very successfully in your local market. We did put a lot of emphasis and it's not inappropriate, but you know, in Ireland, we sometimes prioritize everything and that doesn't, isn't a successful strategy. So I think it is very good that we're coming back to Europe at this stage and looking at it very, um, very definitely. And I think you're, you're quite correct. I think there's a lot of this, you know, this inter-country um, relationships between, between com many companies who are working jointly with companies within Europe. There are people who've worked in companies in Europe who've come back here. I think there's the, the flow of migration into and out of Ireland we've had. I mean, you look at our net migration figures, they don't change anything as much as our gross migration figures have done. And that's a huge amount about people coming from outside Europe into Ireland and Irish people based abroad. And if they move at a certain stage of their lives, they very often marry somebody from that country. And that's a huge, and the minister mentioned, it's an enormous asset uh, for the country long term. So that great opening up we've had of the country over the last 20 years is in fact a, a potentially a bit of hidden, hidden sauce that we have in terms of supporting us. To me, I mean, the one that I've really been delighted to see, because it was definitely not there for many, many years, was the close connection between um, the diplomatic, the embassy side and the, um, and, the, and, the, and the business side. It was really seen that the embassies were very much on the cultural political side and the agencies did the other. But, you know, they all come together. We know that from, from, from all the interactions that we see. So I think that's been, been a further big success. So I'd be quite optimistic that, you know, years of Erasmus travel, years of, of, of them, some of the, the Eastern European people who came here on scholarships in the, in the early 1990s, I think there's a potential there which we should be trying to tap. And the great thing about the internet is it's, a, it's possible to do that in a, in, in a cost-effective way now. And a final one, Francis, if I may, um, Brexit. Do you, do you think Brexit may have punctured a degree of inertia? You, know, you, you mentioned uh, put, taking up, being take, having been taken off the gas. Do you think that that may have made smaller Irish businesses look beyond Britain? Of course, it, it adds costs. There are all sorts of downsides yeah. economically from Brexit. Putting up barriers will always reduce uh, business to some extent. But could it have that psychological uh, advantage of making people think, well, if it's more difficult to, to export to our nearest neighbor, then maybe we'll think about bigger markets further afield. And that could, could be advantageous to some extent in the future. So the research that I did some, some years back basically showed that the productivity levels of companies that were selling on the Irish market and selling into the UK market were about the same. So in other words, you didn't have to up your game to sell particularly into the UK. Now, it is the case that, that, that um, gravity theory and various other economic theories would say you export to your near neighbors first and then you go further. Now, with the Internet, with globalization, it's been possible to talk about firms that are born global because their services in particular may be going international before they even, even go national in some cases. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, we've talked a lot. I mean, I'm sure you could find speeches going back 40 years talking about the need to sell more into Europe. And indeed, when we entered the EU in 73, that was a big mantra. But um, I think it was, it was more of a challenge. Uh, I think now we're in a much better position to do it. Um, and I think the inertia was probably that it, you did have to up your game to go further. That's what the data would say. You did have to up your game to go further into, into Europe. Uh, now the question might become, do I start at all by going into the UK or do I go straight into Europe? Um, and and that's an issue I think that it would be a strategic issue for companies to to, to make it make it make it make a decision on. The old economic theory was that you you got the experience of operating in a foreign market, but arguably up, UK wasn't that foreign, so it wasn't really that hard. Now of course you had the exchange rate difference, so people were taking exchange rate risks and exchange rate costs all of the time. So Europe represents there's a sense in which um, Brexit has really balanced the scale in favour of looking at Europe as a market, as opposed to trying to cope with what's going to be a very volatile UK market over the next decade or so. 
Perfect. Great. OK, I think the scene is really well set now. Uh, I'd like to invite our four panelists to um, unmute themselves and uh, put on their cameras and join us. Um, we have speakers from Germany, Italy and two based here in Ireland. Um, I think we have a broad range uh, uh, of sectors, perspectives, and uh, really looking forward to, to, uh, to hearing your views and hearing anywhere, any, any point that you disagree. We said that beforehand, disagreement can often be as interesting and informative as agreement. So we're going to be very relaxed, uh, very flexible, allow people to say what they want and, and say controversial things if they feel that's necessary. So look, I'm going to start uh, with uh Dieter if um if we have you there Dieter um if not on a uh alphabetic alphabetical order basis I can't want... start my video sorry <laughs> okay well Dieter why don't why don't we see if you can organize that and we'll start with uh Roberto and uh let him go go first so uh, Roberto would you like to introduce yourself tell us a bit about you and your company uh to kick off Sure. Thank you very much. First of all, th thanks for inviting me to this panel. It's, it's extremely interesting. And uh, it's an opportunity for me to bring my uh, experience in starting a, a, gl a global company, global digital company from the outside. So obviously I have a, a very I think, a peculiar view of, of, all the, of trade and, and markets. Um, I started off um, actually studying in a uh, University of Milan, and then uh, I had a, uh, have a PhD from the University of London in, in GIS. I worked across the UK, uh, the US, and Italy, uh, mainly in digital services and in telecom industry. Um, about 10 years ago, I moved back from the UK to, to Italy to start a company um, doing services, digital services for the healthcare. And that company then there was a spin-off of that company and became what is today my Hellbox, which is now a, one of the largest platform delivering digital information on healthcare products in uh, over 70 countries. So it's a purely digital uh, platform and they actually started global, you know, with a global view from, from the very beginning. Okay. Um, let me give you just, just a little bit of information about the company so you understand, you know, what it you know, where, where we come from, um, we provide basically digital information on the use of medicines uh, to patients and healthcare professionals, as I said, in over 70 countries and in over, I think now it's 46 or 47 languages, I kind of lost count. Um, and we, in fact, we, we are about providing trustworthy information across all markets. And um, so obviously we have a, a, a European focus. So our, you know, we'll say uh, about, we cover all the European countries and that's where actually where we started. So we started um, expanding our services across Europe first, and then we look beyond Europe. Um, Great. I hope it's, uh, I mean, I don't want to take too much time for the introduction. <laughs> so. I, let, let me let me just to follow up, uh, Roberto. When we spoke before this event, you you mentioned that you tend to group markets by language. So in Europe, uh, you have the German, the Austrian, and the German-speaking parts of Switzerland, for example. That's that's, that's absolutely correct. So uh, let, let me just just me uh, give you a bit of, of, of we have uh, uh, our users, which are basically people uh, accessing the content we provide. And we group them by, by language, in fact. So um, in, as, as you said, for example, German uh, is, is a cluster for us. German speaking uh, countries is a cluster for us, which in, in Europe obviously that means Germany, Austria, and part of Switzerland. And, and we do the same you know, across uh, other parts of the globe. Um, and that's absolutely correct in terms of end users. But then we have customers. And for us, the customers are the companies that have uh, that sell products in the healthcare space. So basically, obviously, pharma companies, but also you know all, all different uh, medical devices and so on. And because of regulations, we need to look them on a country specific level. Uh, but in Europe, uh, regulations are uh, more euro wide, uh, and that makes things uh, extremely a, a little more well. No, I wouldn't say simple because they are not. They're still complicated, but. Um, some of the, especially the new 
topics and their innovation, which is being developed and regulated at the EU level, which is basically the EMA, the European Emergency Agency, makes uh, addressing this innovation and bringing them to market across Europe a lot easier. Okay, and tell me, Switzerland is not a member of the EU integrated in many ways. Does that make a difference when you're looking at the Swiss market compared to the German or the Austrian? Does, does its non-membership, full membership, mean that there's a, diff a different way of dealing with the Swiss? There is, uh, not for the end users. Obviously, the market is as open as, you know, uh, but in terms of regulations, there is an additional complication because you have to, the market is, is kind of small, and you have to put an extra effort to cover and to cater for that for that market. And so, um, yes, I would say that it's, it's not a huge thing, but there is there is a big difference. Okay. Yes, interesting, interesting little kink there. Dieter, <laughs> great to see you. Uh, good uh, to have you join us. Your um, your your organization works in making physical products rather than Roberto's, who's providing a, a, an online service. Uh, maybe you could do the same. Tell us a bit about yourself and the company to get it to get going. Okay, you're welcome. Um, my name is Dieter Castell. I'm sitting in the west of Germany. Um, I'm an engineer. Um, I was a sales manager for Mercedes-Benz and um, BMW here in Germany. So um, I knew all the skills from selling cars and all the technical details. Um, I, I, I was looking for a challenge in 2018 and I got contact to Enterprise Ireland um, and looking for a new, a new job, a new challenge. And so um, I found Dennis, or Dennis found me, um, looking for a man in their target area that, that was in Germany, um, where, we, where we sold some chassis over plenty of years, 20 years, let me say, but only in the North area. And um, due to Brexit upcoming discussions, we didn't know what happened with, with the UK market. Um, they found the decision to enter further market, new markets. And um, we had some experiences um, in the north of Germany. And so it was um, their decision to find a man leading the market in Germany. Um, that's me now as a general sales manager here in Germany. Um, not entering only the um, the north of, of Germany, also the, the whole area of Germany, the east, the south, the west. Um, it was very important to have a man here uh, who's coming out of this area, speaking the language, knowing the skills of, um, of our customers, um, what they need. Um, yeah, Germany is a, is a special market. The, the, as you know, German people are um, over the time and they have the some specialties and um, the Irish business culture um, is different um, in some um, areas to the German. And so it's very necessary to have a, a person um, dealing with both, you know, with both cultures. And yeah, and that was my, exactly my, uh, my intent to, 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 to go to Denison and, well, and it's running very successful. Um, as you know, Denison is a market leader in container chassis. We are building chassis behind the trucks where you can carry container boxes, 20 foot, 40 foot, what you see on the motorways everywhere. And we are market leader in, in, in Ireland and in the UK. Um, we have two factories. The headquarters is in Nace near Dublin. Um, there are all chassis built and welded, and then we ship them um, overnight in five stack um, over to Lancaster. There's our second factory in the U in the UK, um, and it was a good habit to 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 bring them overnight to the factory. And um, in England, they were um, shot blasted, painted, and completed, and and sold for the for the English market only for the English market. Um, and we didn't know what um, which uh, difficulties uh, the Brexit will bring to, bring to us. Um, let, I will come back on that later. Um, we were affected by that. And so they found the decision we need for the Irish factory. Um, it is EU. We have the euro. Um, so it's very easy to... To, to, to deal with European partners, with, with other European countries. And um, 
yeah, and, and so we set it on the road and um, yeah. My first um, job was um, to, 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 to found workshops um, all over Germany, in the east, in the south, to, to bring the, the service. The German is asking, um, when I buy an Irish chassis, um, do I have problems with spare parts or with service? Um, or, or, or. And um, we could deny that because we are now running four stores, uh, spare part stores in Germany, all over the area. And um, my, my goal is to answer immediately if a customer has problems. Um, I'm on the phone the whole day. They can call me in the evening. They know that. And um, and, and Ireland, or the, the, the headquarter, um, I have some, some people there um, supporting me in every case. I, I, I send a question to Ireland, technical details or something like that. I receive the answers within a few hours and I can serve the customer in a perfect wise. And I think this is a... Um, yeah, this is a key to enter a new market like Germany. Ginger, I was, I was, I want to follow up on that that point you made about how different business cultures are in Ireland and and Germany. But a question that that occurred to me originally: you you have two manufacturing facilities. Yes. How has Brexit actually impacted? Because you do the initial stage of uh, production in Ireland, then on to the UK. Are you going to continue that? Is that feasible? Is it uh, possible to continue doing that with Brexit? Or are you going to have to have a continental European production facility? Um, no, um, it, it, it's working perfect like it is. We have to deal with some difficulties, of course. Um, but actually, um, there's no factory on the continent plant. Um, we will serve um, Europe or the our main markets like Germany and um, now following up Austria and Swiss, um, we will serve them from Ireland. It's working perfect. Um, the first thought what, uh, thought what you have is um, we need a factory on the continent, so we have short of ways or something like that. But um, there are so many things to, to, to set up a new factory and it, it's not necessary because it's working very fine. We were affected by Brexit. Um, as you imagine, we have some... Um, we have some global suppliers uh, for, let me say, trucks and chassis, um, and, and many of them come from Germany. So it's easy for me to sell the products here in Germany because I say, hey, it's an Irish-German cooperation. And so they say, okay, we buy a little bit made in Germany, and we have also Ireland, and that's working perfect. Um, let me say the lights, the real lights. Aspek is from Austria. It's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a world market leader for, for rear lamps on the okay. chassis and trucks. And Hella, the German company, is also well known. And in some chassis, um, especially for the English or the Irish market, we use Hella. Here in Germany, we use more Asperg. Um, and so you have a, a frame contract with them to, to supply. And um, all over the years, all the Hella lights, they went to, 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 to our factory in Lancaster. And overnight, when the truck was coming back, uh, when bringing the chassis over to Lancaster, he took some parts and, and, and brought them to Nays, to, 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 uh, to, to, um, to our headquarter. And um, actually, we have the problem with the customs. You have to announce there will be a, um, a, a parcel with, with lights and this and this. And um, this, this um, causes so much trouble um, yeah, that we have now the... Our, our, our target to get these things immediately to NAS. Okay. Lancaster is a market for the UK and um, it, it, it's running uh, perfect. Everything is fine so far, but we have, to, we have to look in the last one, two years that all our suppliers will uh, supply directly to, to, to NAS. And um, Hella told us, yeah, it, you can get it uh, on the 1st of January next year. And, and actually um, we have to deal with with the customers and with the customs and uh, to get the stuff over there, that's a little bit difficult. Um, yeah. And okay. Good, uh, Dieter. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in. Time is moving on. So look, rather sorry. than I was originally going to go to Simon as the third speaker, but I think just given your overview of everything, Simon, let me take go to Liz Waters first as as another business person, uh, an Ireland based business person. Um, Liz, would you like to do as the previous two speakers have done? Just give us introduce yourself and 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 some thoughts on your business. 
And of course, good morning, everybody. And thanks to the minister and Francis for the very good and very interesting presentations. Um, my name is Liz Waters. I'm CEO of the Watershed Group, which is an Irish owned print packaging company with headquarters in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, we have several manufacturing sites in Ireland, three in fact, um, a sales office in the UK and a manufacturing site in Germany and Poland. And I suppose, who are our customers? Just about everybody globally is our customer. Um, everybody needs package, packaging. Every product needs a package. So we're in a very dynamic situation dealing with some of the world's and Europe's most largest and most important brands. Um, I suppose the perspective I'm bringing this morning is slightly different in that um, in Europe, we are working within the markets. We have man manufacturing sites. Um, we're also exporting from Ireland uh, to, to Europe and from Poland and, and uh, Germany into other European company countries. So we are quite export focused, even though we're working within the, 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 the various European companies. Um, we're very lucky, and I suppose um, Francis's point about Europe not being um, one market, and I think that is a hugely important point for everybody listening to understand. It's one of the areas that our competitors, who are the biggest in the world, are mostly American companies. It's one of the things they consistently uh, fail to understand. They see Europe as a block, and uh, you can run into all kinds of trouble by having that kind of a mindset. Um, there is no doubt that every ind individual market is both different and has its opportunities and particular challenges. Um, we're fortunate in that our, our senior teams in each plant are, are Germans and Poles. So we have had a very interesting learning curve from them um, about the various differences in the markets. And uh, but as Dieter has pointed out, Germ Germany is a particular market. You have to understand the operating protocols there to do well in that market, as is Poland and indeed the UK and every other company. So I hope my relevance to your panelists today will be that I will be able to give them some insights into the particular ways of dealing with whatever markets they are interested in. Good, thanks. Uh, Liz, I was interested that your two facilities on the continent are Germany and Poland. Germany, one can understand, as being simply the biggest by population market um, economic size. But Poland, of course, a big country as well, 40 million people. But interested to know why Poland? Was it related to the number of Polish people working here? Were there cost factors? Interested in, in that? Well, the second one, the cost factors. We saw Poland, obviously Poland is a much uh, lower cost base. Um, they, they have a huge indi indigenous market themselves and there are plant is on the German-Polish border. So we immediately saw the strategic advantage of exporting from a lower cost base. That's not without its difficulty as I'm sure Dieter, Dieter will understand. German companies tend to like dealing with German companies. So there's a whole area of work and difficulties there is to be overcome. Um, increasingly, the world is becoming more global and the German markets are opening up a little bit to co companies from overseas. Um, and there's no doubt that working from a lower cost base is an advantage. Um, for, for us exporting into the German market, which we do because we are inclined to sectorize our particular sites so we would be very strong, say, in the drinks distillery business in Ireland, exporting to different uh, companies over the world. Good uh, opportunity in Germany is that we can meet their cost base. We are competitive. We can we can meet it. Whereas exporting from Ireland into Poland would be difficult because of the disparity in the cost base. Okay, and and, and language issues, Liz. You know, Europe is a small place with a lot of languages. Um, but how, how, what's your main way of dealing with that local recruitment? Of well, we're very lucky in that we have, you know, feet on the ground. There are German and Polish teams. Um, Germany is an easier market, I suppose, because they they speak English um, and they will engage in English. Obviously, um, from a, the, it's a very hierarchical market, and um, people deal with with, with very in a very strong cultural way. Manners are terribly important in Germany. How you present yourself is very important in Germany. Um, and certainly it is seen as manners to be able to converse at a sort of, maybe at a dinner level, to be able to open a conversation in German. That certainly gives you an advantage if you can speak even conversational German. 
Interesting, interesting. Great, thanks. Uh, so thanks to our three business uh, uh, people. Uh, last but not least, and maybe to bookend uh, somebody also who has a, a, a wide ranging perspective and, and experience uh, on a lot of these issues, particularly around the shipping, the transport of goods, Simon McKeever from the Irish Exporters Associ Association. Uh, Simon, over to you to give a bit of an intro to yourself and, and what the I IEA does. Thanks, Dan. And good morning, Dan. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, and it's great to be here to, to talk about this this morning. So the Irish Exporters Association is the representative body for the export industry in Ireland. So it's it's not just about the exporting companies. It's about, we, we have, a I suppose, a, a rounded view of the whole industry. So, you know, 70% of our members are exporting companies. They're also importing companies because there's very little um, raw materials in this country other than what comes off the land. So we, we have a good perspective of what's happening on, on both sides. Um, uh, but also, you know, about 25% of our members are in the business of getting the goods on and off the island, whether that's the, the shipping companies, the ports, the airports, the airlines, the, the hauliers, uh, the, the rail and the rail network. They're, they're all members of ours as well. So we, we, we kind of get a chance to see what's going on in that. Um, we're, we're around 70, we're 70 years uh, old. Sometimes it feels like I'm 70 years old as well, but uh, we're around a long time um, and, you know, we represent, um, so we are, we are a lobby group. Um, we work very closely with government on a lot of things. Um, we are a, um, we do a lot of training and education for our members, particularly around science um, um, and in the healthcare sector and its sustainability. Um, we run a, um, you know, a, a visa and export documentation business, um, and there's some stark figures in that at the moment, and I'm going to outline that in a sec. Um, and then we run a, num a number of different kind of events and webinars in that. So it's it's a community that we, it's a community we represent. I, I, my own, from my own background, before I did this role, I, I ran the British version of Enterprise Ireland and IDA's office in Ireland. So that kind of gave me a good perspective of what they do and how they go about their business of supporting uh, companies around the world as well. Um, so just if I can pick up on a couple of points, Dan, with yeah. maybe asking me a few questions. I, I, I think from, from our, there's a couple of trends that we're beginning to see. Um, and if you look at the CSO figures, I think they're very much backed up. Um, you know, if you look at our exports in the first five months of this year, our exports are down to pretty much every single country in the world, bar uh, Britain, the United Kingdom, and Brazil. Um, so, the, so our exports are down. Okay, our imports are are up from um, from most other parts of the world, other than the UK. <laughs> and and there's this thing going on where our, our imports from the UK are down two billion. Um, and from the European Union, they're up about two billion, and they're also up from other parts of the world as well. And and so we're sourcing things from France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Northern Ireland, um, China, Malaysia, South Korea, and the United States. That's where so we're beginning to spread our our wings on the import side. And 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 I I, I think one of the things that when we think of exporting, we, we, we tend to think about exporting the end product and are we very focused on, on, on the end product? Um, and, and should we also look at how we integrate ourselves uh, on the export side into global supply chains? Uh, and I think that this is a, a, a big challenge for us over, over, the, next, um, over the next while. Uh, is that we, I think we need, to, we, we need to move our thinking, not just from the end product and, and designing and building companies that are looking at the end product, but how do we fit into that global supply chain mode around the world? Uh, and we are definitely, definitely seeing um, a set of trucks coming into Ireland since the start of this year that we have never, ever seen before. Mm. So, so, so our global, our, our supply chain is shifting. And I think one of the big opportunities we have uh, and I spoke at an event um, and, and Francis was talking about the role of the embassy network working alongside our agencies in, in, in different countries. I spoke to an event that the Irish embassy in France hosted two weeks ago. Um, and and, I, and I, I really think there is an opportunity about how do we get working on those combined um, supply chains and how we feed into that. Um, and, I, and I think that, um, you know, we have these direct shipping routes that have opened up into France, which bypasses the UK. We are seeing a bypassing of the UK. 
the, the UK as an export market for us is going to remain extremely important and it, and it will remain so. Um, but I, I think that we, we, we are facing this challenge about diversification. And, and when, when we talk to companies, a lot of them are actually focused on the United States uh, as a consequence of Brexit before the, the continent of Europe. And there's one word that I've written down, which I think other people have picked up. And, I, and again, I think uh, France has picked it up, which is familiarity. Um, so I, I, I think that you can have a very programmatic nature of how we develop businesses and how we get them exporting. But cut, there is a lot of companies that just want to go to different markets as well. Um, and, you know, I think one of the reasons why we have been so successful um, working with the United Kingdom and with the United States is that we're extremely familiar with the language, the culture, the law. You know, we have an, a, a deeply embedded historical link with both organizations, both countries. We just don't really have that level of familiarity with any country in Europe, perhaps except for maybe France. Um, you know, I'm, I'm of a generation where the only language that we really learned in school, uh, and dare I say, was probably properly taught, taught was French. Um, and there is a level of familiarity between ourselves and, and the French, which, which has historic um, um, uh, ties. And, and I think that, you know, we can be extremely programmatic. Um, and when I, when I look at our, what we do in this country and what we do in other, and what they do in other countries, um, that, you know, I think we're extremely good at enterprise development in this country and, and developing those kind of type of com companies, but we have a limited amount of resources overseas. We're a small country. And, and how do you develop that familiarity? Um, and I, I had a conversation after that uh, French uh, event that I, that, I was, that I was speaking at with one of the, um, the honorary consuls over there. And it was a fantastic conversation. And it was about how do we get people in Ireland talking to networks of Irish, Irish French people in France? And how do you get that level of familiarity going um, so that it becomes natural for people? And, and just picking up on something else, and again, I think it was um, Francis uh, that, um, uh, that, that mentioned it, with, without um, that, that level of familiarity, and it takes a very long time to maybe to make that happen. But we look, we did have the Global Irish Network years ago, but there is thousands and thousands of Irish and Irish connected people working all over the world. There are loads of Irish businesses with overseas managers, um, you know, a, a number of, so Dieter is, is one of those, um, you know, who is well disposed to Ireland. How do we activate um, that piece in particular to get people going? Because I don't think the UK market is going to disappear for us as, as, a, as an export destination. Um, I think it will remain a very, very important export destination. As I said, exports to the UK have actually grown this year. Imports have collapsed um, from, from, from the UK. So I, I think the challenge for us is familiarity. I think we need to keep doing what we do extremely well uh, through our agencies, through Enterprise Ireland. Um, I think there is a global threat on our FDI model. Um, and, I, and I think the opportunity for us is to, is to make Ireland the best place to grow a sustainable business. So we really, really, we really, really have to concentrate on how we're building our indigenous businesses and growing that. Um, and I, and I, as I said, familiarity is one of them. Um, I keep doing what we're doing with our, uh, with our agencies, but I really, really think, how do we access global supply chains? How, how do we become part of other large organizations, global supply chains and feed into that? Uh, and and um, sorry, the piece Francis was saying, and I, and I thought this was really interesting, is that export growth in the longer term is largely driven by increased numbers of products and markets. So you need to sell the same thing to different countries uh, rather than selling more of the same stuff into a particular market. There is an opportunity to do that if you can access global um, supply chains. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a big opportunity. And myself and this honorary consul, we're, we're talking about how you develop that piece between France and Ireland. Okay, thanks, Simon. I've, first of all, Roberto, did I see your hand up? No. Okay. No. No. Okay. So, look, um, we don't have that much time left. So, people who are on the call who are in business looking to expand, if you have specific questions to any of our panelists or all of our panelists on issues uh, related to how you might expand, 
please send them in. I'm happy to put them to people. Um, a question to following up on your uh, comments, Simon, and maybe one that's relative to you, uh, Liz. You were talking about, uh, Simon, the connectivity for imports and inputs for Ireland-based companies that could help them become more uh, competitive. Liz, I imagine that you import stuff that are that's used as inputs into your final product before you ship it again. Um, one of specific questions to both of you on that. Simon, there's been more connectivity to the continent uh, as a result of Brexit. Um, has that made it, do you see companies using that extra connectivity, just frequency of, of connections? And what about the costs? Have costs of shipping to France, like I know globally shipping costs have spiked up um, and it may be difficult to filter that out, but do you think costs of shipping to the continent um, and bringing stuff in from the continent will fall because of the increased connectivity? Well, I think, I think where does that price end up being because of greater connectivity is too early to say where that will end up being at this point, but certainly industry stepped in uh, and really, it was the arrival of the DFDS ship in, into Ross Lair before Christmas, led by industry, yep. um, which completely transformed that. So once they came in, other other um, shipping companies responded. Um, so if you were to compare, and and in in shipping goods to the constant, time is also money. So so right now, it is it is still more it is still quicker to overall by and large send items through those direct shipping routes than it is to send them through the land bridge. Now there is companies that are continuously testing the land bridge to see if it's any quicker. Um, and some of the northern routes into, into um, Belgium and Holland and that are, are, can, be, can be a little bit quicker that way, but by and large into France, it's quicker to go direct shipping. Well, once, th so that combined with a decision by a lot of the large predominantly American owned companies in Ireland to, to, to look at how they were shipping and how they were sourcing in, in the run up into Christmas last year has had this displacement effect where, where Britain is beginning to be bypassed as, as a source of, um, of inputs into, into Irish business, Irish based businesses. Um, and we're definitely seeing that. So, so companies are telling us they're buying from other parts of the world and you can see it in the trade figures. As I said to you earlier on, we, we started seeing at the very start of this year's um, trucks coming in from actually Italy was the one that was 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 the country where we started seeing these trucks coming in that we'd never seen before. And, and what actually that then did was in the nature of Irish freight, where you have an awful lot of very small businesses, family owned businesses carrying a lot of that freight. The, a disruption begin to happen in that because the, the the nature of freight is it's it's it was Ireland UK pick up and drop a load in the UK into France and back in reverse, so so now what we're trying to do is marry up that direct piece so the so the goods going out that those trucks are able to pick up something back in France, um, so cost wise um is it is probably a bit more expensive to to ship directly, um, time wise it's better at the moment. Um, and as for the other aspect to take into account in this is drivers and drivers ours. And I know this is getting really down into the nitty gritty of it, but, but that driver piece is a huge issue, in, particularly in Ireland and the UK at the moment. Um, if you have a driver who's had a good night's sleep arriving in France, um, um, he's, he, he or she is then able to drive for, um, for the eight or nine hours without having to stop. So, so there is pluses and minus uh, to both of it. Okay, Liz, just in terms of your own business, have you changed your sourcing because of Brexit, because of increased connectivity to, to the continent? Or would yes, you plan it? It was absolutely a critical area that we worked on prior to, to Brexit. Um, and it was one of the things in fairness to Enterprise Ireland and to the Irish business community, we got out of the stops very quickly. And we were all forced to present our Brexit strategies and to write them up. Um, we work with Enterprise Ireland quite closely and we had to submit our Brexit strategy about a, new, a year in advance. So it focused all the senior team on where you know, the issues in supply chain. Um, we, would, we would source our, 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 our goods from some of the biggest companies in the world and obviously they worked very hard on it. So certainly uh, the, the biggest um, raw material we, we buy is paper and we buy it from a very large multinational company. They have bypassed the UK and they now have a depot in Ireland. So we, in fairness, we got out of the stops quite quickly as a business community. 
there is certainly a drive amongst all of us to bypass the UK. There's no doubt about that, Simon is right. Anything that can be sourced from the original source, because many of the goods that we were importing were maybe coming from Germany, but coming from a depot in the UK. Yeah. So that has stopped. We're finding that it's coming uh, much more directly. So far, we haven't seen a huge increase in the cost, but as you know, the cost of ingredients is sort of a hyperinflationary market now. Prices have just gone through the roof in just about everything. Okay, okay, good. Roberto, can I come yeah. uh, over to you and uh, ask a question about when, when you sit down to look at a new market, a market that you haven't been in, say, you know, I don't know, Finland, I don't know if you're in Finland, a country with a very unusual language, not a big market. What, what, what do you do uh, as, yeah. as your first steps to get into that market? So, uh, well, we, we've done this... Uh, process a number of times so it's, it's kind of consolidated now um, the first thing we do is to establish a presence which means attracting interest from end users so that means building the content so providing local content that they they can access uh, so this is the first step and that will give us the opportunity to establish a presence to make a brand uh, known okay we couple that with some advertising. Uh, we're talking about digital advertising, of course, okay? Uh, to make sure that people are aware that we exist and the services we provide. That's just to build basically an audience and a potential, uh, a potential market that we can then go to. Uh, we have two basically business routes. One is through e-commerce. So we usually look for partners, local partners that can sell the products for which we supply the information for through our site, okay? And we don't do direct, we, we do, we look for local partners because obviously that cuts the cost for shipping and everything. So we, we look for a, a local presence as close as possible to the end customer. And the other thing is we look for um, potential uh, company, for companies in, in the healthcare space, they want to buy our services. Um, and that's something that we uh, usually do through partnerships. So we still look for local partners to be able to um, talk directly to the, the, the companies there. It's, I have to say for the big, for the largest companies, we, we can drive this uh, prospecting, let's say activities um, from where we are in Italy. But for, uh, there are hundreds of say thousands of smaller ones where it's extremely difficult to do remotely. And so it works very well if you do through part from a local partner. Okay. So that's basically our strategy and it's worked across all markets. Um, basically, sometimes country by country, sometimes by areas, that, that really depends. Okay, good. Okay, so maybe not, despite being a, an online business, some traditional things uh, are, are remain the same, needing local local people. Absolutely, absolutely correct, absolutely correct. And yes, we, the, the easiest and most cost-effective way is, is to do this through partnerships. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, right. I think that's a really important insight. Liz, you wanted to come in there? Yes, um, uh, it was a point that Francis underlined and Simon also followed up on. I don't think we can overestimate the importance of networking um, for entry into these markets. Most of them, particularly Germany, have very strong Irish-German networks the embassies are a great source. So they'll always open their doors to any sort of suggestions if you want to have particular connects, the Enterprise Ireland. But I think particularly in, in this digital world now, post-COVID, where we're doing business much more online, the, the, the importance of levering, leveraging your network can simply not be made more important, I think. Okay, uh, good. There's a massive amount of Irish people in Germany. It's quite astonishing the amount of Irish people that are in senior positions in, in German companies. Okay, well, maybe go to Dieter on that. Dieter, you, you mentioned that issue about business culture. If uh, somebody from an Irish small, a small Irish company was looking to start in the German market, yeah. what, what sort of things would you say, this is important, this is the, the business culture in, in Germany is very particular about, uh, we're both wearing ties this morning, I don't know, are, are you, <laughs> in many parts of the world, nobody wears a tie anymore. Um, you know, any thoughts on, on, on thing, advice you would give to Irish businesses going into Germany for the first time? Yeah, 
Okay. You have to speak the language um, of our customers and they expect if, if the salesman comes, uh, you can go to the, to the car house everywhere. You have to wear a tie, of course. You, 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 can, uh, you can't do it, um, but uh, they have a quick opinion about you and um, I think it's not very helpful. <laughs> yeah, you have a list um, figured out that we have some um, uh, traditions and if, if a businessman comes, they, they expect um, to be absolutely in time, um, not one minute too late. This is very important in Germany. If you have an appointment at 10 o'clock, be there. If you're too late, you can go. In, in, many, in, many, in, in many areas, it is like it is. Um, you, in my opinion, you have to um, analyze the market which you want to enter. Um, which are your um, target customers? Um, in which areas um, are you dealing? And so many questions. You have to, to analyze um, yeah, how, to, how to enter this market, what are the habits in this country, and um, then you can deal with it, of course. Uh, let me say, um, we, we had a man in, in, in Ireland, in Nas, before I came, um, he, he speaks, um, let me say, 60, 70% um, German. And he tried to enter the market from NAS, um, but he hadn't the, the direct contact to the customers or so. He, he, he was um, speaking English, of course, um, but you have to look, the east of Germany uh, was influenced by Russia. And so they didn't have any English language um, 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 learning um, in, in, in the east of Germany, they learned Russia. And um, if you come now and, and you're speaking English there, they won't understand you. And um, yeah, you, you must know this and um, yeah, these are the, some facts. This is what... what... Great, that, that, that's uh, inter interesting stuff. Liz, but back to you and a similar question I put to Roberto about getting into in new markets and what your market entry strategy is, how it differs uh, country by country, uh, what your experience has been. Are there any countries that you found particularly easy, particularly difficult uh, to start uh, in. Well, I think, as I said earlier, I think all com all countries have their particular challenges and it's just understanding what they are. What we do is that we are dealing with some of the international brands. So our strategy has always been to try and be a supplier to them globally. So if we are supplying them in the German market, we look to see what are the other markets that we can leverage that into. Um, and I suppose it's similar for all c c countries, whether you're operating in Ireland and you're dealing with an international company in Ireland, a low flat hanging fruit would be to try and be a supplier to them in whatever other countries their manufacturing is. So that has been very much our strategy to leverage the actual contracts we have and work on them globally. We have a European sales team. And what we would say as a strategy is it's the commercial decision of the senior team where we produce it. So we're not fixated on particularly producing market specific. So if we have a speciality in Ireland or in Germany, we may, it's the commercial decision of the group where, where we export or where we produce it. So we are very much leveraging our, 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 our portfolio of companies to grow globally across the world, really. I mean, we're exporting some uh, to distilleries all over the world now based on our experience in the Irish beverage market. So it's really, again, lever leveraging your, your, your business network as well as, as well as your personal network. Okay, good. Um, I just want to flag, we're very close to the end now. If, if people have particular points that they didn't get to make or just a closing thought, I, I'll probably just come to each of you in the final four minutes for just one minute. If you have something that you do want to say or something that you feel you did didn't get to say or a reaction or whatever uh, but Simon um, you interact with an awful lot of your members who, who are exporters um, do you hear and, and you mentioned that France that particular familiarity in Ireland uh, maybe more than other continental countries but from you know what you hear from your members is are there continental countries that are maybe easier or more difficult to to penetrate um, for, for, for exporters, either you know new exporters or those who are who already have uh, familiarity with exporting. Well, I suppose the ones I, I if I the ones that they find the most attractive are beyond a doubt Germany and um, and France and uh, it's purely the, the the scale and size of those markets um, and there's there is reasonable links in there. I think 
you know, you look at, and again, Francis put the statistics up or put the number, put uh, mentioned it, but you look at the likes of Belgium, uh, Netherlands, and perhaps even now France, because the amount of stuff that's going through it is that the, the, the trade figures into those countries are largely skewed by, by what's happening in, in, say, the port of Rotterdam. Um, but I, I go back to what I said, you know, when we talk to our, a lot of our members, they, you know, even now they're kind of thinking US rather than Europe. Um, because there is this level of familiarity with with the with the United States, and and just one final kind of thing on it, I, I always recall, um, uh, and at the time I was working for the for the for the British government, the um, back in 2010 when we were in the depths of a recession here, there was this massive push to for, uh, this there was this massive push then for market diversification because you know we needed to sell wherever we could at the time and there was a huge push into the far east in particular you know china was a huge focus of it once once the world economy started picking back up in in 2013 and that you know we saw a lot of the members really just beginning to refocus on the markets that were easier and i and i think that that um that brexit and and, and the other the other big trend by the way that's going on in the world is you you are going to see a localization of supply chains going on and um, you know driven i think by trade and um, i don't want to say disputes but trade um uh, disagreements for want of a better word and, and i think that companies particularly larger global companies are going to want to have a more secure source of supply for ireland and um, uh, that means more within the boundaries of the eu um, and um, i go back to what i said it's not always about making the product or the service and then finding a customer, which is the customer who buys that end product. It is how do we fit into what is going to be this changing world of um, you know, more, more localized global supply chains or, or more, more localized supply chains, which will go around the world. So I, I think we need to take your thinking ever so slightly that it's not just about making the finished product, it's about how do we integrate into that, that system. Thanks, Simon. And, and just to flag to people, the third and final event of this series will take place on Friday, the 24th of September. And uh, I think that that very issue of supply chains and changing supply chains is something we'll, we'll dig deeper into in that final event. Look, we're, we're coming to the end now. I, I'll go around to each of the speakers uh, again, maybe Simon, maybe that might have been your concluding remark, but if you want to come back in, let me know. Um, the importance of networking and meeting people, getting to know people, clearly that has been really hard during the pandemic uh, period. Um, Roberto, I'll maybe ask you all just how important just the personal connections in terms of meeting people, has that been impacted by the problems traveling? Uh, has it affected your business? And in the future, do you see business relationships more being built up like this via Zoom? Or will you tr go back to travel uh, to meet, meet people? Um, thoughts on, on just that personal dimension? Um, yeah. So it's, it, it's, it's kind of funny for us. Um, the, the travel restrictions uh, for us meant two things. One, it was more difficult to engage with partners, local partners, because uh, at least at the very, very beginning, you have to establish a personal connection. And sometimes it's, it's difficult to do it uh, via, via computer screen. Uh, so that, that put a bit of a, of a hold on, on a number of, of activities. But on the other side, the communication with our users and the use of, of data on, on the internet as has increased enormously. So it was actually a, you know, a great uh, growth time uh, for us. Um, and we started getting, for example, because th there is a way for people using our services to uh, contact our uh, customer care. And the questions we get are, you know, <laughs> more in diverse and incredible. Um, starting from, you know, we started getting uh, contacts from uh, people in the, in the airline industries, looking for disinfectants that were compatible with the regulations, local regulation they could use to, to clean and disinfect the insides of, of planes or, or seats, uh, all these sort of things. So that wasn't there before. I mean, obviously there was a, you know, interest and demand for a number of products and for information on how to use those products that was obviously 
you know, triggered by, by by this epidemic and needs to use, you know, need to use it new, uh, apply new safety regulations and so on. So it was it's been incredibly, you know, interesting for us because, um, you know, on the on the digital world, there's there's been a really great growth. I mean, I would say great because obviously it wasn't a, a, a funny a, a time, but it from from a from a communication point of view this we, we've seen a, a tremendous growth okay great and more or less the same question and and closing thoughts to 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 both of our other panelists liz first okay well i think it's been very interesting and in fact it has kind of driven a change in our strategy certainly we didn't find it too difficult for existing contracts and right. We would look maybe in the future at having less feet on the ground now in the sense in the terms of salespeople. Um, there is no problem um, growing uh, existing contracts. Where it became more difficult was that people didn't want to change. So new business entry became more difficult. I think just having an initial webinar is more difficult. Um, low hanging fruit in some ways, the advantage of you grow more organically because you're getting more from, from, from the same customers, but actually growing new markets and sectors are certainly we found a little bit more difficult. Okay, great. And final word to you, Dieter. Okay. Um, and normally before Corona, I traveled Germany for two, three days in the area, possibly the east, the south. Um, I prepare those trips one, two weeks in advance, um, make appointments. Um, due to Corona, I was not able to travel. I worked from a home office, of course. Um, existing customers are very good supported by phone, by email. It's working perfect. But if you have new customers which are interested, they want to meet you. And um, yeah, and actually in Germany, it becomes much more easier to travel again. And so um, I'm planning the next trips. Um, to areas which I want to enter, which I want to make stronger a little bit and um, meet these customers. And after that, I have the connection by phone, by mail, and this is working perfect. Okay, good. Look, we've hit 9.30. Uh, we've, we've scratched the surface. I think we could have uh, could have spoken to all of the panelists individually for, yeah. for, for, for an hour. So much uh, to learn from you all. And it's been uh, Personally, very interesting. I hope for those who've logged on and particularly those who are considering exporting and, and internationalizing for the first time, I hope there were insights and thoughts there. I'd like to thank you all, uh, everyone who joined us here, the four panelists, Francis, the minister, uh, and our uh, partners, Enterprise Ireland, in the event in, for this event. As I say, the next event in this series of three will be on the 24th of September. So I'd like to wish you all a very nice summer and hopefully see most of you back again at the um, at, at the end of September. So have a good day and uh, and a good summer. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. It was a pleasure. Okay. Then thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank bye. So much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.